I, I remember. Yes, I try make to. it a point. <laughs> do, do your very best. <laughs> I will. Oh boy. Okay. We are on page 365 of Sri Sharda Devi and her divine play. And uh, in our class, God is Mother, uh, just looking at different ways that we can approach the divine. And uh, you know, just just add depth to that relationship. I think the more the, the more we remove the limitations, uh, the more we remove conventions and, and add as much heart as possible, uh, God uh, becomes increasingly beautiful the more angles uh, that you can take in order to view her. And um, you know, I think the Divine Mother, has uh, in 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 the form of Sri Sharda Devi, has uh, well, well actually <laughs> I say this every time, but it's true every time that uh, I you know I only came back to religion because of God as Mother because of the Divine Mother uh, that compassion and I I really could see that love uh, you know I could really feel that grace uh, we're at three sixty five is our page. So uh, this, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity uh, just to have different ways of viewing God because we are often standing in very different places when we uh, are trying to relate or trying to uh, invoke the presence within us. And I just find that not having a limitation of gender on God uh, seems like an obvious thing, but having grown up with it, God the Father, God has to be a man, you know, the fundamentalist approach, this is the way it is, do it. If you ask more than two questions, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's nice to be free of that. Nice, nice, with the permission of the divine, actually, uh, to to approach God in, in a way that, that can touch you, that, that is meaningful to you. Because that is the whole point. God will appear to you always as your highest ideal of love. You know that 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 is how God manifests. And any time there's an incarnation, that's exactly what that incarnation is, a highest the highest ideal of love. And so this is how the beloved meets us if he's going to or she is going to take a form. <clears throat> All right, so we are on the name of the chapter is the last visit on the name of the section. No, the name of the chapter is Last Visit to Varanasi. The section that we're in is called Days in Varanasi. And uh, we just got a nice long description from Swami Shantanananda, who was an attendant of Holy Mother on that trip. And we just finished reading that last week. And so today we're going to walk around the city with Mother. So Varanasi, if you don't know, uh, that's the river. That's it's right on the Ganges. It's uh, famous for the burning ghats, actually, which I have a terrible story about that that I think is hilarious, but I don't think a lot of people think it's hilarious. But um, I'll tell it just because I'm I love to mix things up a little bit. <laughs> but my friend Philip and I went to Varanasi, uh, and. Um, way back when and, and it's a wonderful city to wander around it's the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world uh and uh which is very interesting but then if you read a book uh on varanasi a history book that i read by this scholar uh she said that even though it's the world's oldest continuously lived in city there's no building in varanasi that's older than 200 years <laughs> which I found to be a very interesting uh, little tidbit, little piece of trivia. But it's a fascinating city because uh, the way I described it to people when I got back from that trip is that it's like walking around. Uh, Ritu, hello. Good to see you. Uh, when you walk around Varanasi, um, there's another name for Varanasi, and it keeps trying to bump its way into my head. Uh, Benares, right? Yeah, when you walk around Benares, it's like walking around someone else's dream. Uh, you have no idea what you're going to run into. You have no idea what's going to be around the next corner. Uh, and some of the, some of the, uh, you know, there. 
it was been obviously designed long before cars. And so all of the roads get really narrow and then get really wide or just suddenly do a sharp turn or go around a building. So there's no knowing. And like sometimes you're in alleys so narrow uh, that they come in, both your shoulders can touch both sides at the same time. And I was walking down one of those alleys and came across a big white steer with giant horns uh, standing right there in front of me. I was like, huh, <laughs> how do I get past this? But uh, just about that time, we came around another corner and there was uh, these two very old men sitting on either side of a basket. And when as soon as we showed, came around the corner, one of the old men picked up the lid of the basket and there was a cobra in there. And the cobra kind of came up and it wasn't very steady. And that's when Philip told me that they usually give them opium to keep them a little calmer than normal. So that snake came up, was kind of wandering around and the, the guy who was with the guy who obviously owned the snake was trying to irritate the cobra so it would make more of a show. And the cobra actually struck at him and he ran off. <laughs> but while we were standing there, Philip and I, I, after we walked away from that, I told Philip, I said, oh, I'm really hungry. And he's like, I am too. I was like, what should we eat? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> You're going to know where I'm going with this as I say it. And I was like, but it smells like this barbecue nearby. Let's go see if we can find that. <laughs> you do not know the level of horror and Oh, God, I don't even know if there's words for it. When we came around that last corner and we were right there at the burning gods, you know, with the bodies burning on the... And I was horrified to realize that human flesh smells just like a hamburger. <laughs> there's, there's no difference. And I, against all of my judgment... Uh, smelled burning bodies and got hungry. And I did not know how to process that. <laughs> I did not know what to do with that little piece of information about myself. <laughs> but that's Varanasi. <laughs> that, was, that was my trip there. I have some really funny stories about that, actually. But they're, I'll have to tell them sometime, some other time. So we're walking around. It says Varanasi is a temple city and a citadel of India's spiritual tradition. A devotee put his carriage at the mother's disposal so that she could visit any place in Varanasi whenever she wished. One day, the mother and her companions went to see Tila Bandeshwar Shiva. Upon seeing the deity, she remarked, this is, a, this is a Swayambhu Linga. And a footnote says, the image which is not man-made, but found in natural surroundings, springing from the earth a self-manifested image. Another evening, she went to attend the Vesper service at Kedarnath. Shiva. What is this? Oh, the service of Kedarnath Shiva on the bank of the Ganges. After the service, she said, this Kedar and the Kedar of the Himalayas are identical. They are connected. If you see this image, it is as good as seeing that one. The deity is truly living. Oh, what a fascinating idea. Does anybody know anything more about that, about the connection of these two Shiva images and where and why that story comes up? That's fascinating. But these are uh, these self-manifesting lingas. Uh, I saw one in Southern India on Mother's Hill um, where it wasn't actually, there was the main temple, which is Mother's Temple. And then outside of Mother's Temple is just this little tiny, little tiny shrine, this, you know, just a small thing. I want to say it's the size of a doghouse, but I'm afraid somebody would get very upset with that comparison. But it's just a tiny little little house, and in it there's a lingam. And I was told by the priest that was with me that day, kind of showing me around, that it wasn't intended to be a temple there, but that that lingam arose out of the ground itself. And so they have they now worship Shiva there in a small temple next to Mother's Temple. One day when the mother visited the Shankat Mochan temple, the priest asked, Mother, where have you come from? She is from here, replied the monk who was with her. The mother told the monk, no, no, please tell him that I've come from Jairambati. 
The mother did not refer to Karmapakur or Calcutta as she had a deep love of her native village. One day in Varanasi, the mother met a monk of the Nanak sect on the bank of the Ganges. She offered him a rupee and bowed down to him. Holy Mother also met the old monk Kameli Puri. Golatma asked him who provided him with his food. Mother Durga, the holy man answered in a strong voice, who else do you think? Holy Mother was impressed. That evening she said, ah, the face of that old monk is appearing in my mind. He is just like a child. The next day, the mother sent him some oranges, sweets, and a blanket. After seeing Chameli Puri, Holy Mother did not desire to visit any other holy man. What a wonderful, wonderful vision or view. I, <laughs> I, like, I like the fact that I actually feel a little bit of a kinship from that with that monk, you know. The who feeds you? Oh, I, have no, I have no idea. The mother, <laughs> the mother is feeding me, taking care of everything. You know, that's that's the life. That's that's the truth of every one of us. You know, we should be as ready to answer that question that way as any other way. That it is the Divine Mother that's taking care of all of our needs. You know, providing if, uh, and I told you that I went through that whole process of having to think that out. <laughs> When I was looking, when I was thinking about working for the post office, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was did, well, was wondering if mother had put that sign out there that there was that they were now hiring if she put that there for me, because it's still there. It's been two years now. And, uh, you know, and I, I mother said, no, of course, of course not. And I had mentioned in my prayer, you know, that that I would understand that it would be kind of nice because then I would know how much money was coming and it would be more steady and reliable if it was coming in the form of a paycheck. <laughs> Needless to say, Mother doesn't care for that idea much at all. <laughs> she very much, very much scolded me in my mind and said, uh, you know, so you think that if I gave you a paycheck through a through a business, that that's reliable and 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 easier but if it just comes to you directly that's somehow not as good or not as reliable and uh, when i heard it that way in my mind i was like oh my goodness what have i said that's totally true and i really thought about that and i thought well what a beautiful way because i find it very 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 encouraging to remember that the divine is covering all of uh, everything you know while i'm here and i i'm i'm super happy that everybody can feel that way, that just because, you know, mother is handing it to you through your business or through your work, she's handing it to you nonetheless, quite directly. And it's one of those opportunities, you know, when you get that check to take it out of mother's hand, you know, to see that and understand that, that it is the divine universe that's taking care of all of us, providing all the food and everything that, that which builds our house that which makes our clothes that which makes our bed you know all of this comes from the mother and it's it's harder to see because we've put so many steps between it and the divine mother you know whereas if we were going out and <laughs> you know sleeping under a tree uh it would be a very direct experience of of sleeping in the company of the divine it would be very direct and so sometimes because we have all of these levels around us of abstraction, uh, we've made ourselves so foreign in our native land. We don't, you know, we don't even see ourselves coming from the earth anymore. We don't see ourselves as, as products of the universe uh, anymore. We see ourselves as separate from the whole thing because we've abstracted everything and pulled ourselves so far away from that awareness. You know, I, I saw, I was many years ago now, but on Facebook, there was a post by a young guy, he was 16. And this was a real post. Of course, it went viral because he said, uh, I just found out that milk comes from a cow. That's disgusting. I'm never drinking milk again. And I read that and I was like, are you kidding me? How <laughs> the guy, that guy grew up 16 years and nobody ever told him that milk came from a cow, you know? And you see, that's that's what's happened to us. We've abstracted ourselves so far, we don't even know where our food comes, where our food comes from. Oh, it comes from the grocery store. Yeah, it's always wrapped in plastic. <laughs> Somebody prices it. 
So, but here, mother is, you know, mother is seeing this in this monk. Where do you get, who takes care of you? Oh, who, Mother Durga, who else would you think is taking care of me? You know, she was so happy that that was the answer directly from off the tip of his tongue, that that's really where he saw his food coming from. And then I like the symbology and what does she do? As soon as she gets home, she sends him some food, really indicating that she is in fact Mother Durga and she is in fact the one taking care of him, you know, feeding him, which I find quite lovely there. One day, several women called on Holy Mother and found her busy with her nephew and niece. She asked Golatma to mend her torn cloth. And one of the visitors says, Mother, we see you are terribly entangled in Maya. <laughs> You'd have to get some context for that, you know, because in, in India, for the tradition of a holy person, of a monk or a, or a nun, uh, there's no sewing. Sewing is considered karma. And so when I when I took my sannyas and I got my my uh, garwa for the first time, there's not a shirt, a korta, and and your dhoti. You get a dhoti, then you get a chudder, and then you get another dhoti. <laughs> and that second dhoti gets wrapped around your upper half in like a shirt. Uh, and you do that for the ten days that you're in sannyas camp, kind of as just sort of a, a, a head nod to the fact that, uh, you know, that, that, that wandering monks, wandering sadhus traditionally don't wear anything that is stitched because stitching is karma. You know, it's, it's uh, adding your, it's adding some egoism to a process. And what was interesting to me about that, actually, when I found that out was uh, when I was a boy, I went on a field trip when I was living in Germany, we went to, I think it was, uh, either Trier or Worms, one of those two cities, they have a big cathedral there. And in that cathedral, they have Jesus's tunic hanging that, that he, that they say was his. And when I read the little blurb at the bottom, uh, they said, this is Jesus's tunic. It is important to note that it is seamless, which means it contained no stitches, you know? And I was like, wow. That's a very interesting crossover, <laughs> you know, that really points to the time when, when the world was one, much smaller and all these traditions, these ancient traditions, uh, you know, uh, were everywhere and were common. And so even in Jesus's time, he would wear a seamless or a tunic, some clothing that had no stitching in it. And I found that fascinating. So here, this, these women see her re uh, repairing something. And they say, oh, you're terribly lost in Maya, you know, which is funny because Maya, you can equate that with egoism. And how could you look at Holy Mother <laughs> and say, oh, my, look how, how lost in Maya you are, you know, and, and uh, it just kind of shows uh, what can happen with religion, <laughs> you know, and how you can know just enough to be stupid. <laughs> And this, this is a very big problem in religion because a, a large number of religious people know just enough about it to be wrong, you know, or to be silly. And uh, I, I remember myself growing up, you know, in the, in, in the church and the Bibles, all of the, everybody in the family very piously had our own copy of the Bible, but where did we keep them? In the car. <laughs> so, so they'd always be there on Sunday when we went into the church. And that was the only time we used our Bibles was when we would go into the church on Sunday morning. <laughs> and so you see, don't, don't let religion, well, you do whatever you want to do, but I, 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 I beg you, please don't let your religion play that role in your life. You know, you're missing, you, we would be missing, I was missing uh, so much and had no idea of the gold that I was exposing myself to uh, because I never, I never, I never made it my own. I never brought it in here. And so it's important to do that so that you wouldn't look at the Holy mother and think that because she was sewing, that she is entangled, terribly entangled in Maya, you know, that she has a horrible problem with egoism. <laughs> so, so she asked gold to mop, mend her tend her, 
her torn cloth. And one of the visitors says, Mother, we see you're terribly entangled in Maya. What can I do? She replied. I myself am Maya. Wow. Which is exactly true. The world of change is the world of a mother's power. You know, and it's it's in this world of change, when we identify with the mind, uh, that we dwell. We dwell in mother's world. And it is mother who has to give us permission, who has to uh, allow her maya to let go of us. You know, that, that the power of liberation lies in mother's hand. And, and it is she who must release us from our fascination with change. So what can I do? She replied, I myself am Maya. It is doubtful whether the visitor understood the meaning of mother's words. I, I wouldn't, oh, well, I would have understood, I guess, with my background now, but I still would have staggered a little bit to hear her say that, like, I am Maya. It's like, wow, wow. I hear it would be a long, long drawn out wow as i sat there trying to really wrap my head around who i was standing in front of it'd be like my god yeah no it would be one of those things i think you would have to end up in an ashtanga pranam you would just have to just go face down on the ground in front of her to to even begin to grasp the depth of that statement that came out of her mouth so easily Wow. Oof. <laughs> mm. It's beautiful in a way, too, because it really says, you know, Maya is always such a negative thing to us. It can't be, you know. If you remember this sentence at the time when you feel like this, remember when Maya is entrapping you, you know, and catching you. Remember this statement and recognize Mother in there. And know why she calls it her play. You know, she's deceiving you. She's playing with you. You know, she's she's playing with her dolls with you. And you're pretending that all of these things are real. And you're pretending that all of this is, is as it is. And so you play at the game. And really, if you read this sentence, you can know you're playing. Mother's playing with you. You're playing with each other. You're taking this world as real. So you're taking her play as being real and you are playing in the sandbox. And she loves that. You're her only friend that can really imagine properly. <laughs> you know, you really believe all of her sandcastles are mountains and all of her and all of her play, you know, is, is oceans and skies. So it's a wonderful, wonderful little thing there to remember. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for intimacy to see that, you know, don't don't separate Maya out from mother so that it looks like it's a, a scary or spooky or, you know, thing. It's it's mother. So there's grace in Maya. There's going to be immense beauty in Maya. Right. And mother herself, Maya itself is the one that you have to petition to be set free, to let go of that entanglement. Right. But what a wonderful way to pray now, knowing that Maya and Mother are equated and that it's her play and your play. And it kind of adds to that feeling that's been growing in me, that Mother is not so interested in us focusing on getting out of here, you know, that that shouldn't become the point of our life. It's like what Sri Nishrigadatta said in his to the chapter, of the, the title of the chapter we just finished in that class, which is the, the point, the, the purpose of life is living, right? It's not to get out of here. Just like in the old temple, in the old, in the old uh, Testament, I think it's the book of Micah, uh, where uh, God says, you know, uh, what, does, what do I require of a man but that he enjoy his work and walk humbly with his God? But this is the point of life. You know, if we made getting out of here the point, then we're all going to be living in the future. And when you're living in the future, there's anxiety there. And so your religion, your spiritual life will become a cause of anxiety. Oh, I'm not realized. Oh, I'm, I'm so deluded. Oh, my mind is so crazy. But bring it down to the moment. You know, bring it down to just the moment. And it's you and mother. You and mother. 
The world you see right now is the direct manifestation, the direct incarnation of the Divine Mother. She's become everything that you see right now. And so understand, understand. That's a beautiful, beautiful point. Another day, Holy Mother was seated with Golab Ma and several other companions when a, mother, when a woman whom she had never met came in wanting to show her respect. Her eyes first fell upon the dignified figure of Golab Ma. As she moved toward her to take the dust of her feet, Golab Ma pointed to the Holy Mother. Now she approached the Mother, but Holy Mother, in fun, pointed to Golab Ma. Now, Remember just a moment ago when I when Mother said she was Maya, and then I made that comment, Mother's tricking you, you know, she's playing with you. Now you get an example of it right here, you know, that she's <laughs> she's like, no, no, you went to the right person. <laughs> yeah, go go see Golap Ma. She's the divine mother. So as she moved toward her to take the dust of her feet, Golap Ma pointed to the Holy Mother. Now she approached the mother. But Holy Mother, in fun, pointed to Golap Ma, and Golap Ma again directed the woman's attention to the Holy Mother. But the mother again pointed to Golap Ma. This teasing game continued for some time. Boy, that's an understatement. <laughs> this teasing game has been going on for eons, and we're sitting right in the middle of it still. So Mother, Mother loves to play. She loves it, and she wants you to play along, but she wants you to recognize her in it so that you're not terrified by her monsters, her pretend monsters. This teasing game continued for some time. Then Golatma said to the stranger rather sharply, Don't you have any sense? <laughs> Can't you distinguish a divine face from a human one? Does any human being look like that? The woman at last recognized the elusive grace and charm of the mother's face. As a magnet attracts iron, so divine beings draw spiritually inclined people. Holy Mother's visit to Varanasi was not publicized, but people came to see her in large numbers. Betty Leggett, her daughter Alberta, and her son-in-law George Montague knew Swami Turiyananda, who had lived with them in America. After having a guided tour of the Sevashrama, they went to pay their respects to the mother, whom they had previously met in Calcutta. A large crowd gathered on the street in front of the ashrama. The Indian devotees were amazed to see American and English people paying respects to the mother. I, I think Indian people still get a kick out of that. <laughs> in India, especially. <laughs> yeah, here, I, here it wouldn't be a big deal at all, I guess. But in India, I, that's something I really had to get used to. You know, when, when a white person's wearing Garawa in India, every time you meet an Indian, you sit there and you watch their face because they're having to decide at that moment that either you're a charlatan of the worst kind or you're a saint of the highest order. There's nothing in between <laughs> because your white skin represents the highest ideal of wealth for them <laughs> and the garrow you've got on represents the highest uh, ideal of renunciation and to see them both together at the same time I, it's really something that you that you just get accustomed to whenever you meet somebody they just there's no in between <laughs> you're either to be dismissed outrightly which has happened to me a couple of times or you're almost to be worshipped which has also happened to me a couple of times and, uh, you know, <laughs> so I can fully understand that's even after this order being around for a couple of hundred years so that, you know, it's it at least has a history now. But here in this little meeting, there's no history, you know, seeing seeing white devotees uh, for these traditions is quite, quite something. So the Indian devotees were amazed to see American and English people paying respects to the mother. One day the mother was resting her noon after her resting after her noonday meal when suddenly her sleep was broken. She went to the veranda and found a beggar woman singing in a plaintive voice, "Where have you gone, my mother?" 
I haven't seen you all this time. Please take me on your lap. What kind of mother are you, so stony-hearted toward the child? Reveal yourself to me, mother, and don't let me cry anymore. Well, you tie that in with that previous page, you know. <laughs> Mother is Maya, and she's sleeping, and she's woken up. And why? Because someone begging at her window. The beggar approached her, bowed down to her, and said, My long-cherished desire has been fulfilled at last. I cannot tell you, Mother, how happy I am. Holy Mother learned where this woman lived and that she supported herself on alms. The woman did not ask for anything from the mother except devotion for God. Oh my God, she's playing all of her parts exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. So she meets the mother <laughs> and asks for nothing but devotion. Wow. <laughs> The woman did not ask for anything from the mother except devotion to God. She further told the mother that she had been hoping for a long time to see her, but was afraid that she, a mere beggar, would not be allowed in her presence. At the mother's request, she sang again. The mother told her to visit her whenever she wished, and the woman took some prasad and left. Oh, my God, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's just, just, my God, just beautiful. Oh. A few days later, the beggar woman arrived again, holding a guava that she had received as alms. With great hesitancy, she offered that ordinary fruit to the mother. Holy Mother very graciously took that fruit, touched it to her head, and said, food obtained by begging is very pure. The master loved it. I will eat your fruit. Tears trickled from the beggar woman's eyes when Holy Mother accepted the fruit. The mother asked her to sing, and she sang a song on baby Krishna. Impressed, the mother asked her attendant to give some prasad to the woman and told her to come back again. Hmm. Another day, Holy Mother went to visit an ashrama for old women. The women offered flowers at her feet. She told the caretaker, you are doing such a wonderful work. You are serving these helpless and hapless women, which is akin to serving God. Once a poor woman whose husband had renounced his family came with her young daughter to the mother for help. She asked her to tell the monks of the ashrama to help her financially. Holy Mother did not promise, but gave her a sari, a rupee, and fed her and her daughter. Swami's Prema Pragyanananda and Chinmayananda had once been freedom fighters against the British. They took their initiation from Holy Mother and became monks of the Ramakrishna order. Although they had renounced political life, they were constantly under surveillance by the British government. In 1912, the Viceroy of India, Lord Harding, was a target of assassination attempts by Indian nationalists. A bomb was hurled at him, but he was unhurt. News came to the ashrama that the police were looking for suspects, and they were targeting former revolutionaries who had been connected with the earlier bomb cases. Pragyanananda was, con was connected with one of those earlier cases. Holy Mother heard of this, but she was unperturbed. She said firmly, what is the matter? He is no longer involved in politics. There is nothing to fear. Nonetheless, Swami Brahmananda asked Pragyananda to leave Varanasi temporarily. Not wanting to create any inconvenience, he left for Simla to visit his brother. His friend, Swami Chinmayananda, accompanied him there. Holy Mother felt bad that they had gone so suddenly. She felt a little relief when she heard from Shudhira. Prag Pragyanananda's sister, that she had fed them before their departure. <laughs> yeah, she felt bad that they had gone so suddenly, you know, 
And again, you just see her heart, the mother heart in her. The reason she was upset and she was comforted was when she found out that his sister had fed them before they went. So she was disturbed that she hadn't had a chance to give them some food and to set them on their way properly. <laughs> wow. That's beautiful. <laughs> Although many people in Varanasi asked Holy Mother for initiation, she refused, explaining that in Varanasi, Shiva is the guru. She advised them to come to her in Calcutta or Jairambati for initiation. Spiritual life becomes inspiring if one practices japa and meditation, studies the scriptures and the lives of illumined souls, and performs worship. Although Holy Mother did not study, she often attended the Bhagavata class in the Advaita Ashrama. One evening, Sudhira and Sharala went with the mother to hear the class. Sharala recalled, the, last two, the talk lasted two hours. After the talk was over, Holy Mother bowed down to the pundit and offered him one rupee. Then, in the course of conversation, the mother said, Ah, what a wonderful exposition. The pundit explained it nicely. Wow, I don't feel so bad. <laughs> so that guy went on for two hours, and they loved it. <laughs> Another evening, Sister Sudhira, who and I were seated near the mother, she said, he who has really prayed to the mother even once has nothing to fear. Oh, <laughs> That's amazing, you guys. <laughs> That's amazing. So... <laughs> I don't have to say what that means to you, do I? I've been grabbing onto that one where Takor says, oh, those who have come here have said this is their last birth, but now we have we have this, I mean, God. If you've prayed to the Divine Mother even once, you have no reason to be afraid. Boy, lock that, lock that so safely in the heart. <laughs> There's so much grace in that promise. <laughs> <laughs> She's turning me into a blubbering baby tonight. Goodness gracious. But what kindness. I just can't get over this sweetness and this devotion of her to us like this. Oh. Wow, there's so much growth in this and a possibility in this. You know, I've been walking around thinking, oh, I'm in mother's dream. I'm not in mother's dream. I'm in mother herself, you know, and that this Maya, it's not, it's not to be gotten rid of in that sense. It's, it's to learn, to see it you know, like the, like the, the beggar woman saw, you know, mother and, uh, and propitiate it, show it by your actions and by your life, turn your life in, into a, a, a request for pure devotion. You know, that's the way to traverse this world, this world of change, is through devotion, letting everything in this world point you to the beloved. Let everything in this world point to that which is not changing in you. You know, become aware that you, that you are aware of all of the change because there is within you the divine unchanging ever manifest. If you were a part of this, you would not see the change. It would be like being in an elevator because you're all moving together. But because we're not, we see all change. We see the changes in our own body. We see the changes in our own mind. And that which is seeing it is that which does not change. The very thing we're searching for, the very presence of the beloved, the divine. And so really the right way to traverse maya is not in fear and anxiety and a desire to get out, but full of devotion, being taught by everything that's manifested to look and, and recognize the divine unchanging within, within you 
and then your very existence in mother, the change, you know, the changing, the changing reality. And to see that and to grow in that, that intimacy, grow in that sweetness and find your freedom through that relationship with the change. Oh, wow, that can go so far. Some beautiful, beautiful tools we've been given tonight. <laughs> you can run a long way with these. You could really grow from these. Another evening, Sister Shadir and I were seated near the mother. And she, who, she said, he who has really prayed to the master, oh, to the master, even once has nothing to fear. How funny, I read that as the mother the first time, and now it's the master. Well, there's no difference. They are one at their root. Even once has nothing to fear. By praying to him continuous, constantly, one gets ecstatic love, prema bhakti, through his grace. This prema, my child, is the innermost thing of spiritual life. The gopis of Rindava attain to it. They were not aware of anything in the world except Krishna. This prema, my child, this ecstatic love, is the innermost thing of spiritual practice, spiritual life. So it's the most fundamental thing, this prema, this pure love that dwells in us. That love already dwells there in its full force, but we scatter it with egoism because we see objects, we haven't gathered it together into a single bouquet to hand to the mother yet, because we haven't recognized her. When we do, we will also be aware of nothing in the world but Krishna, because we will see him, everything pointing to him all the time. That's the whole point of this play, perhaps, if it has a point. <laughs> She also expressed a desire to listen to the Kashi Kanda, which is part of the Skanda Purana that describes the glory of Lord Vishwanath and the, Shi the Shaiva tradition of Varanasi. One of the mother's disciples, Swami Girijananda, began to read the Kashi Kanda to her every afternoon. One day, Arupananda asked Holy Mother a controversial question. It is mentioned in the Kashi Kanda that a person who dies in Varanasi attains liberation. Is that true? The mother replied, well, it is mentioned in the scriptures and many people come here with this faith, so it must be true. Moreover, those who take refuge in God will definitely be liberated. Varanasi is pervaded with pure consciousness. All living beings in this place are filled with divine consciousness. This is the glory of this holy place. And this you can experience when you're there. You know, when you sit to meditate in, in Jairambati, in of course, there too. But if you sit and meditate in, in Varanasi, uh, you can, it, it's much easier to meditate there. And you can meditate much longer, much easier. <laughs> Than, than maybe other places. It, the mind is just really right there because, because the city really does have that atmosphere to it, that atmosphere of renunciation. I'm not sure how to describe that, a certain stillness, a certain uh, substance, substantiality to the atmosphere there, to the presence. I just get carried away just thinking about it. Just, I walked there after sannyas in my Garoa. I've walked in Varanasi as a householder and I've walked in Varanasi as a monastic and boys in a different place to those two entities. It was like walking in the Himalayas. I walked in the Himalayas as a householder. And then I walked in the Himalayas as a, as a monk. And uh, it's funny because when I walked there as a householder, I was hiking <laughs> and I found it beautiful. 
and I was enjoying the mountains and, and I was enjoying the villages and I was enjoying, enjoying, enjoying. Oh, this is amazing. This is beautiful. But when I was walking in my bare feet as a newly renounced sannyasin, I felt like I was walking in a song and that I was hearing thousands of years of monks who had walked on that trail in their bare feet. And I didn't feel separate from those mountains anymore. I didn't see them as beautiful. I saw them as a song, a song that has been of holiness that has been, been, been present for thousands of years. And I remember just how wonderful that feeling was knowing that I wasn't a guest on these mountains anymore. But I was family, that I was part of them. I was part of that song, part of that story that has been going, been going. <laughs> well, the, well, the time rescue me, no. <laughs> <clears throat> but that song has been going on for thousands of years and will continue. This is the glory of this holy place. On the 11th of December, 1912, Swami Shantanananda asked Holy Mother, the master had many visions in Varanasi. Did you have any? Oh my goodness. I guess the Swami could ask Holy Mother that. Mother, she says, last night I lay awake on my bed when I suddenly saw the image of Narayana of the Seth's temples in Vrindavan, standing by my side, the garland of flowers around the neck of the deity hung to the feet. The master stood with folded hands in front of the image. I thought, how could the master come here? I said, Ras Bihari does not want to believe that one dying in Varanasi attains liberation. The master said, he must. This is all true. That Narayana image said to, said to me two things. One, can one ever get the knowledge of reality unless one knows the truth about God? The other thing I do not recall, I doubt that. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow, a mother, an image of Narayana and the master at the same time standing there next to each other. And the master saying, yes, it's true. If you die in Varanasi, you're free. It's all true. And then one, how can... The other one, how can one get the knowledge of reality unless one knows the truth about God? God and the reality are one. You can't study them separately. Right? Another day, Girijananda tried to argue with the mother by quoting Shankara, who said, liberation is not possible without the knowledge of Brahman. Holy Mother told him, my son, you have read much. You will go in a, you will go in a roundabout way. The master said that one would be liberated by dying in Varanasi. Later, the Swami found that the mother's statement was supported by the Jabala Upanishad, which has a footnote here. It says, according to Hindu tradition, Varanasi and Kurukshetra are called Avimukta, which means Shiva never leaves that place. According to the Jabala Upanishad, verse 1, when the prana departs from the body of a jiva, Rudra gives a saving mantra. As a result, the individual soul becomes immortal and attains liberation. So one should always live in Varanasi, the abode of liberation. Never leave Avivukta. There it is. But understand that the real Varanasi is in your heart. And that is where you must live. And that is where you will find your moksha, your freedom. So we'll start with the story he tells next week. And we'll end here for this week. <laughs>